Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Homeland Security Training Institute podcast. I'm your host, Tom Brady, the Associate Dean for the Homeland Security Training Institute and Public Services Division here at the College of DuPage. Every week we talk about a different aspect of Homeland Security, so we appreciate you joining us. If you've been listening to our podcast, thank you. If you're new to the podcast, well, welcome. I think you'll find it to be very interesting because we do have some of the the top guests on our show found anywhere in Homeland Security. And that brings me to our guest today, who's a, a good friend, uh, Tom Mefford. And I'll talk a little bit about Tom's career because it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, Tom spent, has spent 50 years in public safety. He began his career in emergency management in 1971 as a civil defense director for the village of Plainfield, Illinois, a position he held for 10 years. Between 1976 and 1981, and again from 1986 until 1988, Tom also served as a deputy coordinator for the Will County Emergency Services and Disaster Agency. In 1981, Tom left local government and became an instructor for the Federal Emergency Management Agency stationed in Battle Creek, Michigan. Go Michigan. In 1988, Tom returned to local government service and became the deputy coordinator of the DuPage County Office of Emergency Management, where he was responsible for disaster planning and training activities, as well as managing the department's volunteer program. In 1991, he began coordinating the efforts of the multi-county severe weather warning system, which included the National Weather Service and 15 counties in northern Illinois. Tom was promoted to coordinator of the DuPage County Office of Emergency Management in 1995. Tom retired from DuPage County in February of 2008 and joined the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, FEMA Region 5, serving as the Integration Branch Chief within the National Preparedness Division. In 2009, Tom was reassigned to the Office of the Regional Administrator as the Emergency Analyst, and in 2018 was promoted to Executive Officer. Tom retired from federal service in 2019, and I am so happy to welcome you, Tom, to the podcast today. Well, thank you. It's great to be here. Well, you know, it's really great to have someone with with your career. You, you, You know, when I was reading your bio, I was like, Wow, I was getting kind of woozy because it was 50 years in public safety. We talked a little bit about this before we started the podcast, but tell us a little bit about how you first got into public safety. What was was the first job you had? Well, I actually started in this business um, as a radio operator dispatcher for the Illinois State Police. And when I began that career, my, my total goal in life was to become a police officer. And, and I had a great opportunity um, at a young age to become a radio operator to kind of get in on the ground floor of that profession. While I was there, uh, I was given a couple of responsibilities that related to disaster communications. We had one of the mobile communications van that served the, the northern part of the state, and I was given the responsibility to maintain and test that on a monthly basis. Making a long story short, over a period of time, um, I was given the opportunity to become the civil defense director in the village of Plainfield. And and that really opened my eyes. Uh, I have to give credit here to a, a state trooper who currently is the mayor of the village of Plainfield. Uh, his name is Mike Collins. Uh, Mike came into the radio room one day as a, as a trooper. He was also a firefighter in Plainfield. And, and he made the comment, he said, okay, Mr. Civil Defense Man, what are you going to do when this happens? And it really opened my eyes that I really better start learning some, some things fast. And that kicked the door open to start going to a variety of training and school activities put on not only by this, the state, by the federal government, but anybody who could give information at the time. And that really gave me the career change move that moved me away from law enforcement, which still is a great career, don't get me wrong, Mm -hmm. but it was very narrow focused on the things that it did back in those days compared to the civil defense program, which really entailed everything. And and that began the start as, as I moved down the road. So, Tom, as you were as you were starting your career in public safety, and and, and you talked to the uh, person who's now the mayor of Plainfield, this was early on. This was obviously before the tornado that hit Plainfield in the early '90s. So, was some of the things that you were working on um, kind of related to planning for events like that? 
Well, originally in the early 70s, um, the civil defense program was not all-encompassing. At that time, it was part of the Department of Defense, um, and its primary purpose was to deal with the effects of nuclear war only. Um, by law, which, of course, everything that was done in the program is based on a law at some point in time, um, the federal law basically said any of the monies that are available, any of the programs that are available, look only at, law, at the war aspect mm -hmm. in the event of a thermonuclear war. In reality, everybody at the local level knew that, well, you know, we haven't had a war. We probably aren't going to have a war in the near future, but we sure have floods and tornadoes and fires and everything else. So very quietly, we all started really looking at those things that were the real hazards that communities faced on a daily basis. And it wasn't until the 70s, uh, the late 70s, um, that the federal government finally opened their eyes and said, okay, look— the money that we're providing authorized by the, um, the, the the Federal Civil Defense Act, which focused primarily on war, yes, you can use them for everything else. Look at all the other issues. As long as you don't take away from the overall prepare, preparedness for that catastrophic event. And, of course, in, in – uh, 1978 is when President Carter created FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, which removed – the civil defense program, as well as 30 other programs from various federal agencies, and slammed them together in one fell swoop under something called FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And the concept at that time began all hazards. So you looked at those things that were possible within your community, and you began to plan for those things. And in our in our community in Plainfield, we had the... the uh, uh, the river that ran through, mm -hmm. uh, as as one of our assistant principals used to call it, the mighty muddy uh, DuPage, but right. uh, that led us to a, a flood every couple of years. So that certainly was an issue. Tornadoes were, of course, another issue. Right. But so many other things became obvious as, as we moved along. Yeah, you know, and we talked a little bit earlier. I lived in Plainfield for ten years. Uh, you know, great community. It's that has grown immensely, I'm sure, from the time that you were there, because I couldn't believe when we moved in the, in like 2005, we came back from Washington, D.C., and it was just ex exploding, that, that town. So I'm sure there's a lot more of this type of training and, and, and exercising that goes on in, in towns like that, especially with, you know, a large geographical uh, or, or large populated areas in, in, in a small geographical area. That's correct. That's correct. And, and in fact, when I first moved into Plainfield, the population was 2,900 people. Mm -hmm. uh, the thing that really, if you will, lit the bomb, the explosion bomb in Plainfield was the Plainfield tornado. Yeah. Um, after that event, people saw what a beautiful little town it was, and it just it just began to expand. And, uh, I forget what it is today, but I think it's thirty or 40,000. Yeah, it's really, really – it's gotten very large. You know, I know that, you know, you ended up working for FEMA um, and, and you mentioned the start of FEMA with President Carter. Um, between that time, you were here in DuPage County at the Office of Emergency Management. Obviously, that was before 9-11, so it, the Homeland Security wasn't attached to that and think until after 9-11. So what were some of your roles here in DuPage County with the Office of Emergency Management? Well, first, when when I started, um, the program was called ESDA, Emergency Services and Disaster Agency. And because of my involvement with FEMA in the years prior, um, I saw a trend across the country. And, and in FEMA Region 5, we had six states. Mm -hmm. um, in in those, some of those states, they began to move it toward emergency management. And the thought was... Emergency services portrays um, an entity or organization that responds to uh, something and provides a direct emergency service. Well, that is not what the program is. Uh, emergency management is really what the picture is. It is a, a concerted effort that occurs before a disaster when that disaster is occurring and then as we recover from that disaster and ultimately then move to the point of post-disaster mitigation, 
where we attempt to reduce the impact of a future disaster if it occurs in that community. So I was fortunate that that we had a, a very um, astute county board chairman, a gentleman by the name of Jack Knipfer, which I'm sure you've heard of. Mm-hmm. Um, Jack was very forward-thinking, very forward-looking in a lot of the things he did. And, and we made a presentation to him about the, the, the thought of changing the name from ESDA, or Emergency Services and Disaster Agency, to the Office of Emergency Management. And we created in DuPage County the first Office of Emergency Management in the state of Illinois. Oh, the, it, this was the first right this here in DuPage first. County. That is correct. Well, that's, that's tremendous. And obviously, we're sitting here in the middle of DuPage County. And so, you know, we've always had a really good working relationship with the Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Management here in DuPage County. And in, in the times that you were there, were there any, what do you remember the most about any particular event that maybe occurred in DuPage County that, you know, you were responsible for or were just part of the response team? Well, I, I think one of the, the biggest things that we started to do um, was as we talked about the role of preparedness. You know, when we look about response and recovery, the thought is, well, there's something there in the way of a plan, a system that's ready to step forward and do what has to be done. And we were a little worried, well, a little weak there when, when uh, this process started. And so we committed a, f- a phenomenal amount of time and effort and energy First of all, at the county level and bringing the various county departments that had a responsibility for disaster in one uh, facet or another. You know, we typically think of emergency responders, police, fire, public works. Well, that's okay, but what about health? What about human services? What about, you know, on down the line? Um, So we brought together the 15 agencies of the county government and created what was called the crisis management team. And we built that team as as an organization that monthly got together and and worked through problems and worked through issues. But then we realized that county government, if we looked at the state statute, if we looked at the administrative rules, if we looked at the, the overall national policy and program, County government is there to coordinate municipal government as well. And if you, if you look at the, the, the philosophy of emergency management based on the national response plan and framework today, the national preparedness goal, in fact, says that it's a tiered approach to disaster management. Um, first responders are the first on the scene. Right. And as, as that said... Disaster management begins locally and ends locally. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I used to probably torque a few mayors off when I used to say this, but the bottom is if there is a disaster, you own it. And no matter how much you want to give it away, right. you still own it. Right. And the best example of that, if you if you think about 9-11, the, the worst uh, terrorist disaster in this country – Who's the person you saw behind the microphone every time there was a press uh, uh, issue? Rudy Giuliani, because mm-hmm. he was the mayor right. of New York. Right. And even though the president was there uh, and did a, a, a stand up on, on the pile and, and talked to the nation, the issue was it was Rudy Giuliani's show. And the state was there to help him. The federal government was there to help. But we could not take it over. The FBI certainly is the lead in the investigative side in a terrorist type of event. But the overall management of that disaster is the management or is the ownership of the chief executive officer. So coming back to the county, our next step was to begin to work with our municipalities. And of course, there's 34 municipalities. And and we began to try to build that that network of knowledge initially at the level of the mayor or the village president. We had one uh, uh, village president who really shined above a lot of others, and that's not saying anything negative of, of mm-hmm. any of the others. But the, the uh, village president of Oak Brook um, had gone through the 1993 floods, and she was elected after that, that event. But she became a, a crusader for emergency management as a system. And, and she had no problem getting up in front of other mayors and saying, ladies and gentlemen, this is your responsibility. And this is what you got to be prepared for. And, and having that, 
that ownership, first of all, that a mayor said, this is, this is my town and I'm responsible. And then being in a position where they be, begin to reach out to their fellow chief executives and build that capability. We began to build a, a pretty comprehensive system here in, in DuPage. Because again, our thought was, if disaster is going to happen, you've got it first. Mm -hmm. And even if you push the red button and says, come help, uh, it takes a while to drive from Wheaton to wherever you're going. Right. And whether you're red light and siren from a squad car or a fire truck or mm -hmm. you know yellow light in a, pu a public works vehicle, it takes a while to get there. And especially when you start bringing up specialty equipment. Um, and then when you start expanding it to the state level uh, and you look at, oh, we're going to call a National Guard or we're going to call this or we're going to call that, it takes a while to get those, those services, somewhere, somewhere between 8 and 12 hours depending on where they have to come from. And when you start talking about the federal assets, um, typically our window is 72 hours. But I'm really curious from your perspective, Tom, um, and, and this is a lot of conversation from last week. Um, in light of the horrific mass casualty events recently in, in the United States, from your perspective, what should we be doing to be proactive and, and basically to get in front of these events before they occur? Do you have any thoughts on that? That's a real hard question. Um, and, and I'll be honest with you, it's it's one that across the board in our, in our profession um, – Folks are looking at and trying to come up with some real answers that, that are not simple. Um, again, it goes back to the plan. Um, from, first of all, the response entities, looking at how we respond, we need to know that. We need to practice it. We need to be able – it's called rote memory. We need to just be able to react. Um, I can think back several years where um, a law enforcement response, even a fire service response to a, a potential shooter was you hold back until you have the right resources and then you go in. And until the police department says it's clear, law enforcement says it's clear to fire service, the ambulance has stood back. Right. Today, we're really looking at a totally different scenario where, where SWAT medics are going in, you know, in an understanding you're going to walk through the door and somebody's going to shoot at you mm -hmm. or p potentially shoot at you. We have to expand the concept of planning not only to government but to business and industry. Um, and, and again, when we talk about that, we need to talk about the, the whole concept of, of all hazards as well. Um, certainly the thing that is front and center right at the moment is the mass casualty incidents, and we're seeing those happening on a regular basis. Um, most businesses are looking at the bottom line. You know, how do I turn out X product and, and generate revenue, which keeps the company going and pays people and so on and so forth? And they don't think about the issues of, of how do I protect my employees. You know, I, I kind of go back and think about the old things of when you and I went to school, you had a fire drill once a month. Right. And you had a tornado drill once a quarter. And how many times have you had a tornado drill or a hazmat drill or a fire drill even? And a, a lot of times when you talk to folks, oh, my goodness, I can't do that. I mean, it takes away from our required hours that we have to right. – you know, but the bottom line is um, we've done some great things in, in the school safety arena over the years. We, yeah. We've learned a lot of things. Law enforcement has, has really worked hand in glove with those school administrators and done great things in a way of building capabilities. We have to take that, that same skill and same knowledge and, and take it to business and industry. Right. But in the same fashion, um, we also need to be looking at all hazards. Um, when Hurricane Sandy came into New Jersey and New York City, a lot of, a lot of things happened. Um, a lot of major corporations that we depend upon for telecommunications, for example, went offline because guess where their generators were? They're in the basement. And guess what was in the basement with the generator? An awful lot of water. Yeah. Um, so we need to be thinking about, again, that whole concept of hazard and risk assessment. What are our hazards and, and what are the potentials for those hazards from becoming real? And, of course, the, the problem today 
or the challenge. Just let's call it a challenge versus a problem. Challenge today is to think about what the next problem is going to be. What what is that next hazard? You know, if you would have thought about folks coming into schools and businesses with uh, automatic weapons, we didn't think about that a few years ago. Right. But but certainly that's everyday life today. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a different a different world we live in, and it's all going to continue to evolve. And we always talk here at the Homeland Security Training Institute about what's in the next big thing, what's the next thing that's going to happen, you know. And sometimes we don't know what that is until it starts happening, you know. So we're always trying to think down the road as to what could be the next next big thing that could cause, you know, problems and and and, and you know events here in the United States. So, Tom, you've come on to the College of DuPage Homeland Security Training Institute as an adjunct faculty member. And moving forward, we're going to be offering classes in areas that you spoke about, a lot of different emergency planning, emergency response, um, basically the, 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 the whole gambit of, of emergency management. I think it's really, really important. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what your vision is as you come on here as an adjunct faculty member and, and what you would most like to, to be able to teach courses in? Without going into a lot of details of, mm-hmm. of uh, change, if you will, my my big area of interest is is building the system. Um, we we tend to look sometimes, and I'm not saying that here with the HSDI program, but in general across the country, we tend to look at this business with blinders. Um, we get very comfortable looking in our lanes, and. The goal of emergency management, in my opinion, uh, and, and a lot of others, in fact, is to destroy stovepipes. Um, we've got to learn that emergency responder does not relate to the color uniform you wear, the color badge you wear, or if you wear a badge at all. Um, emergency responders, in fact, uh, the, the the real emergency responders, the, the real true first responder in uh, I believe about 97% of emergencies, and this is based on a Los Angeles County Fire Department survey was done back years ago, is trained citizens, uh, people who don't wear a uniform at all, right. um, people who know the basic things that that they need to do to save someone's life, whether that's to apply a tourniquet, whether that's to initiate CPR, whether that's to do uh, to turn off the gas on somebody's wrecked home. Um, the more citizens we can train, uh, the better off we are because it, it's a force multiplier to those emergency responders, at least initially, uh, who respond on the scene. Uh, again, when I was at the county, we did a, a quick survey, and, and I don't remember the numbers right now, but we added up every police officer, every firefighter, every EMS person, and and then we divided the population of DuPage County, which was roughly a million people by that number. And it was staggering, the number of, of people that Every first responder would technically be responsible for if we looked at a countywide disaster. And it's important to understand that when a disaster occurs, um, there, there's something we, f- we really fail sometimes to put into our disaster plans. You know, we, we can say, well, we're going we're gonna to initiate this box card and we're going to activate all these police officers and firefighters and ambulances and all this stuff that's going to come in. We fail to put in a four-letter word, which is called time. And that is the amount of time it takes for for that call to go through the system to just get to where that resource is going to come from to say get on the road for that person or that responder to get to you and then go to work. And in that period of time, that first responder has to do something to save someone's life. And so – as we look at as we look at hazards and threats today that are going to be continuing to build and 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 evolve we have to think about how do we train not only our 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 uniformed responders but our civilian responders mm-hmm. as well so that they are prepared to do something to save their life their family's life and their neighbors lives mm-hmm. until the normal everyday government responders can get there and do the jobs that they're trained to do. 
and and that's that I I would hope is is one of the things that I can help do. Yeah, and I totally agree with you. You know, we run a couple of CERT programs here at the college. CERT is Community Emergency Response Teams, and we work with Milton Township, and, and we provide those at least a couple a year. And I got to tell you, Tom, I'm amazed because I always come to the to the opening night and I speak to them, and I tell them, I say, thank you for being a part of this because you're the type of people that I want to live next door to. And we have a lot of those types of people in DuPage County. Um, we have every time we run a class and if people are interested in that, it's a, it's a free program. It's, it's funded by the Milton Township. Uh, they received a grant to be able to do this. And we have 70, 80 people in a class, you know, and they, every class is named the first letter of an alphabet. They go through, I think they're going through the third alphabet right now. Wow. There's so many classes that have graduated. So that just tells me that how important it is not only to, from your perspective, but how important it is from their perspective, too, because they're just raising their hand volunteering. And it's an eight-week program, and we have a lot of people that are, are really, you know, integrated themselves into that program. So I'm, I'm really I'm really quite proud of that. And I agree with you. And I, civilians are, are a, 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 a great asset to first responders if they're, if they're trained in the, in the basics. <laughs> Agreed. And so, Tom, I just want to ask you, a really uh, kind of take a, a right turn here. I know that one of your hobbies is Christmas lighting. So can you talk to me a little bit about that? Because just tell me about what you got coming up and what you're, what you're working on right now. Sure. Well, Clark Griswold is my – no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, I've, I've been working uh, – doing this, this uh, project for about six years. And every year I try to make it a little bit bigger, a little bit better, and what have you. Um, what I try to do is to build a first of all a, a uh, an electronic display of 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 lights. I'm, I'm fortunate to have a, a yard that has about 13, 14 trees in it, so I have a lot of things to work with. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then I really uh, uh, enjoy music and and take those lights and sync them to music and make an experience that people can enjoy and watch and and uh, uh, work through. Uh, this year, I've gone one step uh, farther. I've had the, a great opportunity to uh, work with the Rotary Club in, in Aurora, mm -hmm. and they do an outstanding display down at Phillips Park, and they've been doing that for 12 years. Um, and I didn't realize until I got down there and got started how much of a project that really is. Uh, we've just finished uh, about four weeks worth of work and physically unloading two semis, another trailer, and a building, which is all of the display pieces and testing every light to make sure the light works. <laughs> it's uh, a lot so of work. So it's a lot of work. It's a lot of fun. Um, yeah. I, I, I'm sure you've seen the 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 uh, the shows on ABC and mm -hmm. some of the others where they have the Great American Light Fight. Right. I, I don't go that far. <laughs> uh, my neighbors would throw me out of the neighborhood. I think, um, but but uh, uh, it, it's a lot of fun and and it's it's very therapeutic uh, when you're sitting down there programming the music. You just kind of get yourself immersed into the Christmas music, but also, okay, this light's got to go on and this one's got to yeah. twinkle and you know, uh, but it it it, it helps you kind of just really get into an enjoyable activity. I love, love, love watching those productions. I could never do one. I, I'm, I have a hard time finding a plug to, to, to put a to put a socket in. But, um, you know, I, I think I've, it's really impressive when people do things like that. So hopefully we'll be able to come by your house and, and take a look at it this, this year. How long does it how long does your, your your program run for in terms of like time? Do you get it up like after Thanksgiving or before Thanksgiving or it it well installation becomes or goes on well, early. Yeah. I actually start the day after Halloween, um, so it takes a good month to put it all together and and. Putting up the props and the lights is the simple part. It's all the wires that interconnect. That's the right. other challenge. Um, it goes live the Saturday after Thanksgiving. Okay. And it will remain live through um, January the 5th. Oh, that's fantastic. So the entire month. That, that's fantastic. It runs from uh, Monday through Friday at 6.30 at night until 10 o'clock at night. Fantastic. Well, that's great. Well, hopefully we'll be able to go see that. 
And Tom, I want to thank you for taking time to be on the Homeland Security Training Institute podcast this week. It's been fascinating to listen to your career and also getting your perspective on some really important things. And I, and I think that there's people out there who will learn a lot from this um, coming from your perspective because I think your experience is just is really second to none in this area. So thank you for what you've done and thank you for being, as, being a part of the show today. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. That's Tom Mefford. And uh, this is Tom Brady saying that'll be it for this week. Please uh, join us again as we have other guests that are coming up that I think you'll find really, really interesting. So until then, everyone take care and we'll see you soon. 